Inflation seems to be in the minds of many Canadians these days, especially with the cost of food, fuel and rent going through the roof. Family budgets are constantly being stretched. Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly joins us now to talk about the cost of living, how it continues to climb. Brian, the United States saw a huge 8.7% inflation number today. Here in Canada, we were around five, five and a half points. Should we expect a similar number here in Canada, over 8%? We don't get our inflation numbers until uh, a week tomorrow. So April 20th is when Stats Canada releases our consumer price index. Now, uh, will it be 8%? I certainly hope not. Uh, we have been warned by various um, you know, economists doing proje projections that it would be well over 6% in the month of March, which is what they'll be announcing next week, and that we could see it rise over the next couple of months. A couple of the bank predictions that I've been looking at said over the quarter, 5.9%. So that would be up from what we had last month. We had 5.7. The Americans, three points above us. I mean, that's staggering. It's going to go up. But here's what's going to happen between now and when the inflation number comes out. Won't be registered in the inflation number, Hal, but it will drive up costs for an awful lot of Canadians. The Bank of Canada is going to hike its interest rates to try and deal with inflation try and curb consumer spending, try and curb uh, the borrowing that's happening all over the country, they're going to raise by at least 50 basis points is the projection uh, tomorrow on Wednesday. And then we could see regular rate hikes of as much as 50 basis points. So that's, that's, that starts adding up to your mortgage if you're on a variable rate. It adds up on your line of credit, on some credit cards, on what it will cost if you go to get a car loan or if you look for a new mortgage. All of these things are, are going to go up and that will add to inflation over the coming months, but it won't be reflected in next week's numbers. Now, a large portion of the recently released federal budget was to address issues like the cost of living, Brian, but despite the Fed's hyping daycare and housing programs, you say there's not much help available in this budget. Uh, look, if you're a, a family with a couple of young kids in daycare or about to enter daycare, then yeah, the, the National Daycare Program is great for you. It will reduce cost. It's not the model I would have chosen for the government to move forward on, but it will reduce costs. It's their way of doing it. Um, but if you don't have kids, that doesn't really matter. If you're a childless couple, if you're a senior, if your kids are grown, if you're single, these things don't matter to you anymore. And on the housing issue, you know, they were hyping this as a way to bring down the cost of housing. Many of the programs don't start till next year or later. Um, they won't have an impact for some time. Uh, I believe it was Royal Bank put out a report through their economics department stating that, you know, eventually this might bring down costs, but not in the short term, not, not for anyone looking to buy a house right now. So there's some good things in there. I, I will give the government credit. You know, it's always important to do that, even though I mostly disagree with them. They have one program that some provinces are already enacting, and Pierre Polyev has, has adopted part of this as uh, part of his campaign promise. It's to use the federal spending power to tell municipalities, you want the money? Well, you got to start letting homes be built. And both provincial and federal governments across the country are, are fed up. They're frustrated with municipalities who put up roadblocks to building new housing, which is one of the real problem that's driving up uh, the affordability crisis for home ownership in, in Canada. Now, Finance Minister Christian Freeland called this a fiscally responsible budget, as did a lot of the mainstream media, Brian. Now, you say the numbers actually tell a different story. Can you explain? Okay, so yes, she's spending less money, but she had to. An awful lot of the money that was being spent over the past couple of years were on COVID support measures. But let me put some of this into perspective, Hal. Compared to the height of the COVID spending, which would be two years ago when we didn't have a budget, but the federal government handily put this into their current budget, spending is down about $172 billion. Think about that. They've reduced spending by $172 billion. We don't need the wage subsidies like we did. We don't need CERB like we did. We don't need so many of the support programs. And which many Canadians would say, yeah, those were vital and, and those were needed at the time. We don't need them now. So we're not spending the money. So we're down more than $170 billion. Government revenue is up $92 billion. And we still have a deficit of $52.8 billion projected for this year. That is staggering. Not up 92 billion in revenue, and we still have a 
uh, a $52.8 billion deficit. Um, and the deficits are going to go on for some time. Um, in the next few years, right now, we're spending more on more or about the same. It's tough to tell because they don't give clear numbers in the budget, believe it or not. More or about the same on the interest on the debt as we are on the military. And we all heard that there was going to be great fanfare. There's huge military spending. There's not really. But the deficit spending is $25.9 billion just for the interest. That's like just paying the interest on your credit card, but never paying it down. That's projected to go up to over $42 billion over the next couple of years. If you can call that fiscally responsible, I don't want you looking after my bank account. So, Brian, let me ask you something. With the national debt at about $1.2 trillion, how will this really impact Canadians long term? Long term, that, that $42 billion that I said we're going to be spending just on the interest on the debt will squeeze out other spending. Look, wherever you sit on the political spectrum, we all believe that there are certain things government has to do, whether it's building roads, bridges, highways, infrastructure, um, you know, a, a certain social safety net. And, you know, we can debate about where, where that has to be. But if you're spending this con consistently being taken up by interest payments on the debt, never mind paying down the debt, how do you afford these other things? We are adding to the debt every year for as far as we can see. And the interest payments just keep going up. So that, that minimum monthly payment that everyone will tell you, you can't just make the minimum monthly payment, that's all we're doing. And that's going to continue to squeeze out everything else for generations to come. And the debt will get bigger. And eventually, we're going to have to pay it off, or at least part of it, that's going to be saddled on future gen generations, not on you and me. You and I, we're paying off for the last Trudeau we had in office. We're still paying off his fiscal excesses, and future generations will pay off this Trudeau's. Brian, the federal conservatives will be picking their new leader in September. One of the front runners, Pierre Polyev, is spending some time right here in southwestern Alberta right now. We saw him at a recent Starbucks, had his arm around somebody, people doing the selfies. Now, it seems that everywhere Polyev goes, he's drawing pretty large crowds. Do you think he's a lock to win the leadership of the CPC? We, I, I, I can't say that he's a lock, but I can say it's hard to see if he is selling memberships to these people, how he doesn't become leader. You know, we, we don't know the internal numbers. Um, are some of the others selling a thousand memberships a day as you know they have to be able to sell in order to win? Can't tell. We don't know those numbers and we don't know what Pierre Polyev is selling. But those crowd sizes, you know, Lindsay, Ontario, it's not a big town. It's a small uh, town outside of Peterborough, which in itself is not a big city. More than a thousand people showed up to one of his rallies. Vernon, British Columbia, more than a thousand people. Again, Vernon is not a major metropolitan center. It's been that way across the country. 1,200 people in the middle of the day in Windsor, Ontario. He's going to be getting big crowds in Alberta. We know that. So if he is translating that into memberships, it becomes tough to beat him. Um, you know, I had uh, e even one of the, I, I won't say which campaign, but it was a supporter of an organizer for one of the other campaigns admitting that they know it's going to be tough to try and compete with that. Now, publicly, the campaigns are saying, you know, rallies don't sell memberships, but of course, they're going to say that. It's difficult for them, though. Privately, they're saying it's difficult to see how they get past this. Now, Jean Chere came out swinging at Pierre Polyev, saying his support of the trucker convoy disqualifies him from being leader. But, Brian, a lot of Western Canadians appreciated the fact that Polyev supported the Freedom Convoy. Chere hasn't really gone on attack like this before. What's his motivation? So there's a couple of things around this. One, those crowd sizes are generating a lot of buzz, and Sheree has to figure out how to generate the buzz. Attacking the front runner is going to generate headlines. You and I are talking about it right now. It's been talked about for the last several days in the media. Um, so that's part of it. The other part is, uh, you know, polling showed that there were there was a good chunk. It depended on which poll you looked at, but the Conservative Party was not unanimous. They were split. And some of it was geographical, some of it was age, some of it was occupation. Um, it really depended on those factors as to whether or not you supported the trucker convoy. So Pierre Polyev has clearly come out on the side of that. Sheree wants to pitch to other voters. He's trying to get that other portion of the party and say to them, hey, 
if if you didn't like that and you still want to be in our party, then I'm your guy. You know, he he had to be out there before anybody else. Um, I'm not sure where Patrick Brown is on that. I think Leslie Lewis has spoken favorably, but you know, a lot of the the excitement that was around her has transferred from the last campaign has transferred over to to Pierre Polyev. So Sheree had to do that. He's got to you know generate attention. He because of those poly of crowd sizes, and he's got to pitch to a different part of the party, much like he did with the gun issue. 40% of Canadians, or 40% of conservative voters, support Pierre's position on, on gun control issues, but 60% support Jean Charest, uh, including many across Western Canada. So that, you know, you've always got to realize that within any party, within any coalition, positions that you might you know, that party's definitely this. You look at it, mm, there, it might be more nuanced, it might be more split. That's what he's doing here. Brian, a lot a lot of our viewers on social media, a lot of our supporters of Bridge City News have called Jean Charest a true liberal. He's not even a conservative. How can you really fight that image, especially with Western Canadians? Well, it's going to be tough because he was leader of the Quebec Liberal Party. Now, in fairness to Charest, there was no Quebec Conservative Party at the time. Eric Duhame, uh, an old friend of mine, has resurrected that party and, and brought it back. It's only a couple of years old, um, but there was literally no Conservative Party to run when he was recruited, as he will tell you, by both Preston Manning and Stephen Harper were among the many Canadians that said, look, I know you're leader of the, the Progressive Conservative Party, but Quebec needs you to fight back against the the, uh, the growing threat of separatism. This was just a couple of years after the, uh, the referendum. He had been key to beating back the referendum and for the no vote winning. So he went and led the Liberal Party. Does Charest have a mixed economic record? Absolutely. Um, he hiked the GST or the provincial sales tax by two points after Stephen Harper dropped it by two points. That's something that Jean Charest was talking to me about when he was opposition leader. He said, the provinces need more money. We don't want them to give us the money. We want them to clear out the tax room for us so we can raise our own taxes. So that didn't surprise me. Um, but he did hike student fees. Uh, he did balance budgets. There, you know, it's, it's up and down for him on that. But for a lot of people, they just won't get that the, the difference that back then you were either a uh, Quebec liberal or a Quebec separatist. If you were for Canada staying together, you were in the Liberal Party. It's why Tom Mulcair, the NDP leader, served in, in, in Parliament, uh, Quebec's Parliament with him. Now, Patrick Brown has been going across the country with a little less fanfare than Pierre Polyev, Brian. Now, this week he promised that the Tamil Tigers will be removed from the list of banned terrorist organizations. Why is he focusing on that and not eliminating the carbon tax and putting forth a plan to tackle inflation? You know, I've been trying to get an interview with Patrick Brown, and for some reason, he and his team are avoiding me, uh, which is strange, because I would ask him about the carbon tax. He's been supportive of it before. He shocked the Ontario PC party when, after campaigning against the carbon tax, announced that he would bring one in if he was elected le uh, premier. And at that point, he was on his road to becoming premier. Uh, so, you know, he, he hasn't really answered that as far as I've seen, but he is a big part of his strategy for winning is attracting votes from diverse immigrant and ethnic communities across the country. And there's a large Tamil population in certain pockets of Canada, including parts of Toronto, including other major metropolitan uh, centers, and they don't see the Tamil Tigers as a terrorist organization. Now, Canada has for a long time. Uh, I remember before that, politicians would get in trouble because they would go to uh, events with Tamil Tigers, uh, just like they would with other groups that ended up being banned because they were seeking support from those ethnic communities. That will get you in trouble. I don't love the idea that Patrick Brown is doing this. Uh, have the Tamil Tigers reformed in the last 15 years or so since they've been added to the list? I don't know. I know Sri Lanka is a much different place. We'll take a look at it. But this is just part of Patrick Brown's strategy of trying to win by bringing in new people new Canadians to the party and making promises that matter to them, even if they don't matter to the rest of the, the country, the rest of the population. Brian, the war between Ukraine and Russia continues. Ottawa made a list of more sanctions against a number of individuals and Russian companies. How about sending more military aid? What have you heard so far? So there's two things that are going to happen. One, uh, the federal government uh, agreed to send another $100 million in humanitarian aid 
Um, that was announced at a, a conference in Warsaw, Poland last week that bring the total humanitarian aid from Canada up to, I believe, $245 billion. But there was also $500 million in the budget for military aid to Ukraine. Uh, we don't have a lot more to give. There are some uh, surplus items that we could give that the Defense Department is dragging its feet on, um, you know, Ottawa bureaucracy not moving as fast as it could, things like the Harpoon missile systems, but they have agreed 500 million. So we're going to be doing things like buying armored vehicles to send to Ukraine. How long will that take? How fast can they be made? Well, that remains to be seen. I think the companies will be able to turn them out fairly quickly but then will they get the export permits? Anything that has a military component to it needs an export permit from global affairs. Hopefully that gets cleared away quickly because in the past, in terms of sending uh, lethal aid to Ukraine, that at times has been a problem. There have been private groups that have raised money to say to the government, look, we'll pay for the, the lethal aid to go to Ukraine. You just allow the export permits and, and the, the companies manufacturing the weapons here will send them. We won't even touch them. The government has been loath to do that in the past. Some of this stuff is speeding up. It obviously needs to speed up quicker. Otherwise, this 500 million, it could be like a lot of other budget items and just sit there and lapse and never really have an impact when it's needed. Political reporter and Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, Hal.